Welcome to the Alpha Pickleball Podcast, where we slice through the noise to bring you the juiciest insights, strategies, and stories from the dynamic world of pickleball. Join us as we serve up engaging conversations with top players, coaches, and enthusiasts, giving you an ace perspective on all things pickleball. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just stepping onto the court, get ready for a volley of knowledge that'll elevate your game to alpha levels. Let the rallies begin. All right. Welcome again to the show. I'm your host, Tats, and today's guest is Ryler DeHart. You know, ATP tour, uh, professional tennis player, professional pickleball player. And um, so, Ryler, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. How yes. So, yeah, we've talked before. Um, super impressed with what you did on the tennis side. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Because uh, yeah. on the college side, I mean, you've you you racked up a lot of wins on your way to playing pro. Yeah, that's that's true. I had a good career at University of Illinois. Uh, loved playing for them. Um, yeah, I played all four years there. Was fortunate to have a, a really good career and great coaches and teammates. Um, so I had a really, really good time in college tennis and then played professionally for about six years after that and grinded on the tour, gave it my best. Uh, I still wish I would have played a little bit longer, but, you know, uh, life and I had some injuries and I met my wife and we bought a dog and blah, blah, blah. And the rest is history. So, <laughs> Well, when I, when I see players that have, you know, gone on and be able to do it professionally, I, I always like to ask the question, you know, you, the difference between being a good college player and pros, there's a very big gap. Um, how were you, you know, did that transition come easy or did you, you know, there's a bunch of stuff you had to do to figure it out. Yeah, it wasn't easy. I don't think it's easy for anyone that's transitioning from college tennis to pro. Um, I think a lot of people go that route. I think it's a good route to go. I would encourage, you know, all the, I, after pro tennis, I coached for a number of years, um, both collegiately and on the private side and at the USTA. So I kind of had all the different coaching roles. And I always encourage my players, you know, unless you're like, Winning pro titles, I think going to college is a great option, uh, at least for a year or two, see how you do. If you're not dominating college tennis at the highest level, probably not going to do great in the pros. So I would say you know, I'm a big advocate of, of doing well at each level. There's no shortcuts to success. So, um, But yeah, I think in college tennis, it's a great experience, a great environment, depending obviously on what school you go to. But most big, big programs, it's going to be a great experience. It teaches you how to play for a team. Um, there's so many upsides to it. Great coaching, playing under pressure. I think playing for a team is always a little bit more pressure than playing for yourself, especially if you're, if you like that kind of environment, you don't want to let your teammates down and your coaches and stuff. So I think dealing with that pressure the scoring format is very exciting. So you're kind of preparing yourself for that, those pressure situations. Those are all the positive sides, the plus part of it. I would say the downside, the negative is everything is done for you. Um, you literally are, you know, all you have to do is show up and play your matches. You have to go to class and, and get your, your schoolwork done and practice and do all that stuff. But, you know, they're stringing your rackets for you. They're, you know, providing all your equipment. They're driving you or flying you where you need to go, signing up for every, I mean, it's literally you don't have to worry about anything. And then you get done with college tennis and you have to worry about everything, like all of those things. So that's that's a hard transition for sure. Yeah. So. And, and you know, from college, I mean. To my daughter, Lily. Yeah, <laughs> very nice. Um, I mean, were there certain shots you had to learn? Mental toughness, uh, physicality. What what did you have to work on there to to you know be in the top two hundred or one seventy five? One, it's not an easy mm -hmm. thing, especially in singles. Yeah, no. Um, I I think my game, you know, was good. Um, in college, I think I think the physical part was big for me. Uh, we did a lot of physical training in college, but. Um, the biggest thing that I had to learn when I was on the tour was like taking care of my body because I think I was fortunate, but it was also unfortunate that when I was in the juniors in the college tennis, I didn't get injured at all. Like literally the only time I think I missed more than a week of tennis was when I got in a car accident one time and I hurt my chest on the seatbelt. Like I never had any 
significant injuries until I got on the tour. And that may have been because the tour was just so much more of a grind, so many more matches. But I think it was also, I kind of took that health for granted and I wasn't doing enough of the preventative stuff, like the rehab, the prehab, all those things to keep myself healthy. And then once I got on the tour, I think after the first couple of years, my body started breaking down a little bit more. And that was when I had to learn how to take care of my body. And I still struggled with that at the end of my career. That's kind of why I stopped because I just had a bunch of different injuries and um, I didn't have anyone to travel with me and wasn't making enough money where I felt like I could like do the proper things I needed to do, see the physios, do all that kind of stuff that I needed to do to stay healthy, um, get the treatment that I needed. So that was tough. But if I go back and do it again, I think I would do a much better job with the, all those things, taking care of my body um, and maybe have like some sort of like physical therapist or someone that I worked with on a regular basis. I think that helps a lot because it's just such a grind out there, especially playing singles. Like you said, it's so physical. Um, you have to be in tip top shape and, you know, it's like one little thing can sideline you, you know, like I had a weird finger injury that like I had like a strained tendon in my hand. It was like the dumbest thing. I couldn't hold a racket for like months, you know, just random injuries like that, that were very frustrating. Yeah. But that's all part of it. You know, it's part of the process of being yeah. a professional athlete. So. so how did you discover pickleball? Yeah, so I was first introduced to pickleball. Uh, it was probably like eight to 10 years ago, actually, oddly enough, at we were I was recruiting at IMG at the at the IMG tournament, the ball, what used to be voluntary. And one of the coaches, his like father in law had a pickleball court at their apartment complex and like he had some of the coaches come over and play a couple games. I was like, I didn't know what this was like pickleball. I never heard of it. We played it. I had no idea how to play. I didn't know the rules, didn't know anything. Played a few times back then, but like ne then never really played again, you know, cause I didn't know what it was. I was like, okay, this is cool, whatever. But I didn't think anything of it. And then during COVID probably two and a half, three years ago, maybe um, we saw, we had seen people playing it. we saw it come up on our social media and it was like people were like it was getting more popular. And so my wife and I set up a court in our driveway because we couldn't go anywhere at this time. We were like in lockdown. And I think a lot of people did this as well because it's so easy to just make a pickleball court. And we just started playing and messing around with it. And it was pretty fun. And kids were playing a little bit. And, um, you know, I was still a tennis coach at that time. So I was just like messing around with it. But um, then long story short, I got laid off. This was when I was in Orlando at USDA. I got laid off from that job because of COVID. And then we went to a new place. We were, I, I grew up in Tampa, but we went to go live back near in that area because we had friends there and all that. And then one of our friends, sure enough, was like, come play pickleball. And we're like, pickleball, you can hear about the sport. So we went out and played. And this guy was a, you know, a better player. He was probably like a 5-0, good, strong 5-0 player. Uh, his name is Steve Zolsak. He, him and his wife, we kind of played with them. And he kind of showed me like how to play the real, you know, the real pickleball. And that got us like more interested in it. He taught me like how to earn and all these different things that I had no idea about. And then Megan and I entered our first tournament. We played a couple local tournaments, had fun with it. And then we've ended up playing the PPA in Orlando. We played four or five mixed doubles and we won gold barely. But like we had, we had seen the pros were playing on a different side and we went and watched them and we watched Tyson and Ben and all these players. And I was like, holy cow, like this is crazy. Like these guys are really good. Like this is a different game over here. And that kind of like inspired us to like, I was like, okay, maybe we can do this. You know, like we, we have a good tennis background and we researched it and saw that a lot of these guys had played high level tennis and I like to play doubles. I felt like I had pretty good hands and good touch. And so that helped me with the dinking and all that stuff. And I was like, I think I can play the sport. So then we started playing more seriously <laughs> and then we just couldn't stop. It's just so <laughs> I'm choking. It's so addicting, as many people know. So that, you know, my wife played more than I did. She played the first year, uh, I think two years ago she was playing. She quit her insurance job to play. I was still coaching tennis because I didn't know if this was like a long-term thing, you know. I thought it might have been a fad or something. Uh, but I started playing more and more. And then once the money started coming in more and it started to become more of a legitimate professional sport, that's when I said, all right, let's go. Let's go all in. We got the RV we travel around and we play, we played this whole year. Uh, we played 30, 30 some events. My kids are playing now. They've been playing some tournaments now too. So it's like a whole family deal and it's been really fun. So we're enjoying it. That's awesome. So you mentioned some of the like thinking came okay, but what part of your games 
took took the longest because I find with my tennis background, some parts of the game I have to fight, and then some of it comes easier. Like what? How, how is right. that transition for you? Yeah, I think it's similar to most tennis players. Definitely, singles is always easier. I think uh, depending on your game style, and then uh, just learning how to dink. Yeah, <laughs> learning the soft game, learning how to drop. I don't think is a natural thing for tennis players. Um, but I think if you have good touch and good feel, you know, that stuff, you, you drill it for a while and then it starts coming. And now I actually like dropping and I, I do like driving more, more of my thirds. Um, but I also like to drop and dink and play that soft game too. When it, when it works, you know, I'm choking. Sorry. <clears throat> Can you cut this part out? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways. So, yeah, I think working on the soft game, I think it's always more challenging for tennis players. Um, but, yeah, just knowing, like, I think how to play. You know, obviously the specialty shots too, like Ernie's. I've just now started, like, really improving my Ernie where I think I feel comfortable doing it. ATPs. Um, there's so much to learn in pickleball. Like, tennis, everybody says, like, well, tennis is so much harder and so much physical, more physical. Which, yes, it is. And it's a lot harder to master tennis, probably. But at the same time, like, I always tell people pickleball is easy to learn, but it's really hard to master. And there are so many different skills. Yeah. <clears throat> there's there's way more nuances to the game than tennis, you know, in terms of dinking, flicking, Ernie's, ATPs, resets, drop. I mean, there's just endless shots and even more shots that people haven't even you know, that now you have these weird tomahawk shots and all this crazy stuff. And it's like, it never ends, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. what makes it so, that's what makes it so fun too, though. Absolutely. When I look at your game and I just look at how simple you've kept it, you know, because like you said, there's so many people in so many different shots that people attempt, but you've accomplished I know a lot already by keeping the game very, very simple. I mean, was that a deliberate strategy? Did someone coach you on that or that just you decided that, you know, I'm just going to get good at the fundamentals because, you you know, I don't see you pull out lots of trick shots. I've seen you fall on the ground and get balls and little highlight reels, but you keep your game very simple. Yeah. Was that like a deliberate strategy? Yeah, I don't know if it's a deliberate strategy. I think every time I play a sport, I'm someone that likes to learn the basics, like be good with the fundamentals. Um, and then, you know, from there, it's like, you know, you got to have a strong foundation. I'm a, I'm a coach, you know, I love coaching and I always teach my players. Like if you, if you have a house built on sand or whatever paper, it's not going to stand, you know, you have to have a house built on, you know, brick or, or mortar or rock or whatever, have a firm foundation. So I wanted to learn the, the foundations really well. And now I'm just starting to add, actually, I've been working on my two-hander. I was just drilling it just now. I'm at an indoor pickleball court right now at my friend's house. Shout out to Eddie Anderson. He's got a pickleball court at his house um, here in Lakeland. We're, we're basing ourselves in Lakeland, Florida. Um, but yeah, I've been working on my two-hander a little bit. I didn't have a two-hander in tennis. I switched when I was 12. But being able to hit a two-handed dink and then, be, and then attack with that same ball, showing my opponents more variety from the kitchen line and working on that. Uh, Mr. X, you know, all those different shots, the Ernie I'm starting to get more comfortable with. And, you know, I want to, I don't want to try to do all these trick shots and I, I want to like add these things progressively and gradually. And, you know, I want players like next year to be like, whoa, I didn't know he could do that, you know? So I, I want to add these different tools to my toolbox, but <clears throat> there's no, I think there's no exception for doing the basic things really well and keeping it simple. I mean, if you, this is a game, I always said doubles in tennis was a game of errors, not a game of winners. I think pickleball is the same way. It's it's such a game of errors. You know, if you're constantly trying to win the point and, and force the, you know, hit the winner and hit an um, unbelievable shot, like trying to get on ESPN, you know, that's great. You're going to hit some great shots and you might get some highlight reels, whatever. But I think the players that are that are the best are super solid, disciplined they play percentage pickleball and actually they, they make their opponents beat themselves more than they actually win. You know, I would say guys like Ben Johns, I mean, he's got some great weapons, but he's also super solid. Andre Deescu on our tour dominates. And the, you know, I mean, the guy is just, he doesn't miss dinks. Like he, I'll watch him play. I've seen him play a million times, played against him a bunch of times and he's just so solid. You know, he doesn't give you anything and it's just hard to play those guys, hard to play those players. Um, but I think, 
the way the game is progressing, I and mean, we can talk about this for hours, but now you have to have some weapons too. You can't just sit there and dink the entire time. You got to be able to be a threat from different positions, different shots on the court. And so I try, I'm trying to find a balance. You know, I think I want to find a balance of being solid, being disciplined, but still being athletic, having weapons, being able to hurt my opponents and just kind of be able to do it all, you know? So, yeah. So just, you know, coach's mindset going from being beginner to intermediate to advanced, what are the fundamentals in those specific areas? Yeah. So I would say in for doubles, um, it depends obviously if you started with tennis or not, but I think drilling, you, you have to drill those shots. You got to get the reps in. Um, we spend a lot of time working on the kitchen, you know, just doing drills from the kitchen, dinking, a couple balls and then attacking, you know, reflex volleys, hand speed, working on your, you know, quick volleys. I've been hitting on the wall more lately, just working on my, not changing my grip, you know, back and forth, just forehand, backhand, having that be quick without having to change my grip. <laughs> but, um, mastering those fundamental things, uh, drops and drives, you know, when to drive, when to drop. Um, and then, you know, uh, my thing, I want to try to win the point for three shots by aggressive, but then if I don't, I'm going to go, you know, to the kitchen and I'm going to settle in and try to play solid, you know, obviously it depends on you, who you play, but I think, you know, getting those, get making those first two or three shots and putting pressure on your opponents is huge. If you can do that consistently and not not give away free points on those first couple shots, but still put pressure on them, that's huge, you know. So even singles too. I mean, like in in tennis, we used to work a lot on like serve plus one return. You know, it's like the first two shots, the serve and the and the first ball. And I think pickleball is the same thing. You hit a really deep good serve, and you make your third, whether it's a drop or a drive, your percentage of go, of winning that point goes way up. You know, if you hit a good deep return get to the kitchen and hit a good first volley, you know, or whatever it is, like your percentage goes way up. So it's like mastering those first couple shots, you know, mm -hmm. and working on the, working on the transition area too. Cause I think a lot of people don't work on that because it's like, okay, you're, you're hitting, we hit a lot of shots from the back and a lot of shots from the kitchen, but we also need to practice shots to get from the back to the kitchen. Right. Cause that's, you're going to hit a lot of balls in that area and that's a crucial shot too. So um, you know, but, but it's something we could talk about forever, but <laughs> mastering the basics, you know, I mean, just drilling, getting out there, everybody, most people know what they need to work on. I think most people don't spend enough time just drilling it and kind of, it's like, well, I struggle with my backhand dink. Okay. Well, how many times do you drill it? You know, and that's the coach in me. It's like, if, if a basketball player is like, well, I don't have a good free throw percentage. Well, are you the last one in the gym practicing your free throw? You know, it's like, you can control those things. I struggle with my serve. Okay, well, go hit. I don't see you hitting baskets of serve. Let's hit some extra serve. It's like if you're struggling with something, get out there and drill it. You know, get the reps in. So we've always had that that mindset. My wife is loves to drill too. So, you know, we're out there for hours. I mean, we're it's it's eight thirty over here, and we we just stopped drilling, and we're probably going to drill a little bit more. Um, I had a long day, obviously, like, but but yeah, I mean, there's no. It's not like drill this for this amount of time and then play rec games the rest i mean it's like we, we we drill a lot more than we play for practice so yeah for sure um what are some fun stories you know with pickleball so unexpected stories that you sort of encountered geez that's tough um i mean mlp for me was super exciting this year um had a good run with chicago slice we won the first part of the season uh, winning that was pretty exciting. We in San Clemente at Lifetime Fitness, pretty pretty good crowd there. Um, that was that was definitely a cool experience. Um, a, a random one, like my wife and I don't really play mixed doubles anymore because it's tough playing with your wife. But we did have a good. I, what I love about pickleball, and I'll say this, I want to say this on every podcast I go on, is the come around backdrop. I think it is the best thing in sports, and people want to get rid of it. PPA got rid of it. APP is getting rid of it. Um, but hey, there's no better story in sports than losing first round and then coming all the way back around and winning the tournament. You know, like there's just nothing better. And so, you know, my wife and I played a mixed doubles tournament. Delray was a, like a lower level pro money tournament. We lost in this team. I think it was like, I don't know, second or third round. And 
like I was so motivated to come back and I wanted to play them again. Sure enough, we came all the way back around and then beat them in the final, you know, and then the, and then the game to 15 and we won the tournament. And that was pretty fun. That was at Delray Beach like two years ago, maybe. I guess so. there's no being nervous when you go down first round. You're like, I got nothing to lose. Is that kind of the mindset? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I think when you lose first round, it's it sucks. But at the same time, knowing that you have the back draw, you're still going to get matches in. You can still come back around. Um, I just think it's a great format. It takes a little bit longer, but um, – but I think most of the pros like it, you know. I think I'm coaching me a lot because I, I I said that I thought that's what we should do for junior tennis too because, you know, now the big junior tournaments, Kalamazoo, all these tournaments, if you look at the backdrop, it's like half of them just pull out. They don't even play or they tank or whatever. And I was a college coach for seven years recruiting these kids. And like, when I saw the kids not playing the backdrop, I'm like, why didn't you want to play the backdrop? Like, you know, that's your opportunity to come back. Like, what are you made of out there? You lose and then you're done. Like, is that the mentality that we want for these kids? You know, and I'm just like, and other people are like, well, it's pro sports. Like you lose and you shouldn't get another chance. I'm like, okay, but that's, what's great about sports. Like, it's like you lose. And then what are you made of after that? Like can you come back and win some match in the backdrop. And I haven't done well in the backdrop lately, actually, which is disappointing. I need to get back on the, you know, backdrop backdrop train. A, I think it's in my head that I've like, Ryler, because in tennis, I, I, I I think if I remember co correctly, it's called consolation. So I mean, getting consolation final yes. finalists doesn't feel very good. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But backdraw is is a, still a draw, and you still have a chance in in a lot of pickleball tournaments. And they're they're changing this, which I'm super disappointed in this. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if you took a poll of all the. I know I know a ton of the senior pro players and amateur players. They love the backdraw. Some of the pro players don't like the backdraw, but I don't know. I mean, to me, it's like, like people complaining about backdraw. I'm like, it's kind of, they're kind of soft. Like, <laughs> just play the backdraw. Like, you know, and it's like, if you're going to, if you sign up for the tournament, then play the tournament. Like, backdraw is part of the tournament. That's what I told the kids. I was like, you sign up for the tournament. So play the tournament. It's a matter of principle, you know, like, yeah. yeah. So that's what I, I would tell people. I don't have a problem calling people out that don't play the backdraw. I think, you're, I think you're soft. <laughs> So, there you, go. you mentioned something earlier that's fine. That hey, that's is... more, and I, I always say it's it's more opportunity for me if you don't play the backdrop that's fine more opportunity for me yeah. so perfect perfect you mentioned something <clears throat> that you know piqued my curiosity you said you don't want to play for wife i get it my wife doesn't play sports so i don't have to have that conversation how did that conversation go was it a mutual thing that you guys you know maybe we shouldn't team up right because we see each other all the time yeah right? how did it go down it's tough. I mean, it's kind of like the pickleball breakup. Um, we played well together. We got bronze at the U.S. Open last year. Or this, was that this year? Yeah, I think it was this year. Um, no, we play well together. But it's like one of those things when it's good, it's really good. But when it's bad, it's bad, you know? And it's like, I, I'm i someone that's like very positive, more easygoing. I get competitive like everyone else. But my wife is like super competitive. And so she, I think it's more coming from her. She's like... I think she just gets too competitive out there and then she's too honest with me and it's like, it just, and then I get frustrated because she's not being supportive and then we just start fighting and it just goes downhill. So we decided it was better to have two horses in the race and just, uh, you know, cut our losses on that. Um, but it's fine. You know, I mean, I'd rather have a good marriage than a good mixed doubles partnership. So. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I guess in tennis, what they call it, divorce doubles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think some people can do it. I think I could do it, but I think she struggles with it and that's fine. It's a mutual thing. So. Perfect. All right. Um, I mean, anything else come to mind, tips, um, stories, fun, you know, uh, you know, anything you want to close out with? <sighs> Not that I can think of. Um, I'm just really excited about junior pickleball. It's growing a lot. Uh, my kids are seven and my daughter's about to be nine um, in January. My, my son, JR, is seven. My daughter, Lily, who I showed you before. Um, Lily just became the first, the youngest gold medal medal winner at APP history. She was eight years old and she got a gold medal in the 3-0 wow. in singles. And she beat some, she beat a woman that she had lost to before. Um, twice and then she beat her twice in this tournament um, and so she's improving a lot it's really been exciting seeing the kids come up and 
Um, I'm just excited for junior pickleball. I think it's going to keep growing. I'm a coach, so I love coaching them, and I'm excited to have some coaching opportunities in junior pickleball. Um, I would say, oh, I guess two things are, are good to talk about. Number one, the the like rivalry between pickleball and tennis. Um, I have not been playing tennis lately. I haven't played this whole year. I love pickleball. I think in this part of this stage of my life, I'm kind of choosing pickleball. But I do think that pickleball and tennis can cohabitate, you know. And I think um, I just hope that there's more and more pickleball facilities, which you see, you know, happening, and, and that we don't have to steal the tennis courts because I think that's what kind of starts the the problems. But I think, you know, I would tell these people like, hey, let's just all like kind of, you know, be together and it's fine. Like there's a lot of people that can play tennis and pickleball and, and there's nothing wrong with that. And if you don't want to play pickleball, that's fine, you know, but I think we can all coexist, you know, and be civilized. Um, so that's one thing. And then uh, pickleball is a sport for everyone, all ages, all walks of life. It's, it's an amazing sport. I think it's gotten, I think it's a sport that's gotten way more people than any other sport that I can um, imagine or remember doing an athletic activity and exercise, getting out there, getting off the couch. And so that's, what's beautiful about the sport. Um, and then having now juniors playing and stuff, I, I hope that the older people are accepting of that. And, you know, cause we want it to be a sport that incorporates and includes all people. So I hope that my kids are welcome. And for the most part they are, but you know, that's something that's going to be a challenge for people too, is now there's going to be a lot of younger kids playing. And I hope that's embraced by the pickleball community as well. But I'm um, happy to be a part of that, and uh, I'm just grateful for what the sport has given our family, and um, we're going to continue to play and travel around the country in our RV and see where it takes us. So we're excited for the next for 2024. So Awesome, Riley. Appreciate you uh, taking the time. Uh, yeah, My pleasure. Knowledge. Thanks for tuning in to the Alpha Pickleball Podcast with Tats. If you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe, rate, and connect with us on social media. Stay alpha on the pickleball court until our next session.